Hi everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted to be trying out the podcast microphone of one <laughs> Dave right. Blazik. May I call you Dave? Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, yeah, you have a, a lovely space here, lovely um, podcast It's microphone. my treehouse studio here outside of Philadelphia, right on the edge of Valley Forge National Park. My wife had this crazy idea that when our kids moved out to add on to the house, I, I kept telling her, um, no, people downsize when their <laughs> kids leave. Um, but she was right. Um, uh, so we built this, this open space on top of our garage um, where she paints um, and, uh, and does stuff up here too. Uh, and you, there's some instruments around. We play music, friends come over. And so it's this great multi-purpose space, but you can't see it. This is my sort of corner of expertise in this corner of the room. Um, everybody should have one big open room for doing creative stuff. And I'm convinced of it. I love that. I love that idea. And uh, I noticed the guitar back there. So I'm just picturing you like in the, the circle of creativity here. Yeah. In the circle of creativity. I, I play the guitar to scare geese away. That's not nice. from my backyard. Nice. They can be feisty. I don't blame you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's like my sonic superpower. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, well, folks out there that are listening probably know you best for work on something called Loose Parts that we will talk about. Right. And uh, I, I'm first of all curious with comics, with drawing, with illustrating, uh, what drew you to this field of creating in the visuals? Well, okay, this is a long and weird story. Um, I, 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 sorry, we were speaking ahead of time. Mm -hmm. People should know that uh, I came at this differently and probably differently than most 95% of the people on, on your podcast. I only learned to draw at age 43. I never went to art school. Um, I, uh, I never thought about doing this. I kind of accidentally fell into it. Um, I uh, went to college for journalism in kind of the post-Watergate era and was going to be a reporter. Um, and I found out that I really didn't like um, asking people questions they didn't want to answer. Um, but along the way, I, I had a column in high school, in the in the high school newspaper, and it was a humor column. So I kept that going. At I went to Penn State, um, <laughs> and Penn State had a magazine called The Froth, like The Onion or The National Lampoon of Penn State. And um, uh, I was editor of that for a couple of years. So I was always doing humor. And then I got out with my journalism degree and promptly went to work in a cardboard box factory. So that, that's where the path to major syndication starts in a cardboard box factory. Uh, couldn't find a job anywhere. Um, and um, uh, eventually begged, borrowed, and stole my way into the Center Daily Times, a small newspaper in State College where uh, Penn State is located, because I had the general manager for a a toss away class called salesmanship. Um, and so I, mm -hmm. I ended up there and um, selling advertising. <laughs> and um, uh, it turned out I was a horrible ad salesman, but I could make a pretty good ad, a pretty clever ad, it, it turned out. And um, so I did things like I sold a blank full page to a car dealer. Um, and on the other side, I sold them another blank page. But on that one, I told them we we're going to reverse his logo and then on the front page in really small type but for the best deals in town hold this page up to the light uh, so mm -hmm. um i started in that that started me down that path um and after a couple of years of learning all the ropes of the newspaper business there because i really want i have a deep and abiding love for newspapers um uh, even even though i didn't put my journalism degree to use as a reporter. I love being a part of newspapers. So I ended up um, at the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, kind of doing the same thing I was doing there. I was uh, uh, um, uh, in their in-house ad, ad agency there uh, at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Um, I got the job uh, by sending the guy a pair of socks in a box with a note saying, these are going to replace the ones I'm going to knock off. <laughs> nice, nice. So there you go. So anyways, um, writing I, that so down I, right now <laughs> i yeah i went in there and 30 some or you know then when i left 35 years later from the inquirer i was a creative director of their in-house advertising agency at an agency called uh, media lab and uh, so i had always had a creative career um i had um probably in my lifetime i've written and directed 300 radio commercials and maybe 125 TV commercials. 
Um, and along the way, um, I, uh, my wife and I were at a stand-up comedy show in Philly one time, and I said, this guy's terrible. I could do this. <laughs> so I ended up trying my hand at stand-up comedy for a while in and oh, around cool. Philadelphia. So cartooning hadn't quite entered the whole picture yet, um, mm -hmm. um, but I had always had this sort of you know, creative bent. So I always got this feeling, and, and this is something when I talk to kids, like probably students like yours, is um, sometimes if a dream seems too big, like you can't get it, like that mountain's too big, just get on the right side of the mountain. You just want to get on the creative, if you want creativity, get on the creative side of the mountain, like you're a little rivulet of water. You're not quite certain where you're going to go, but get on the right side of the mountain. That's your start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's sort of your small goal. And um, so after doing that for a while, uh, the um, the editors at the Inquirer, because I worked with them all, all the time, uh, started bringing the submissions from the syndicates for the comics pages to me and saying, um, um, what do you think? And I kept saying, these are awful. <laughs> Not funny <laughs> at all. Um, I mean, I didn't understand. I'm just an ad guy, you know, um, and um, I kept saying they're, they're, these aren't funny at all. And then there was a guy, an old editor of uh, who retired, but he was really involved in the syndication business, really loved comics, loved the industry. And uh, the LA, the then LA Times syndicate um, uh, hired him to just scout around. And he called me up and he said, you know, I really think you could do this, Mr. Smarty Pants. You know, uh, I, I, you kept saying, you know, it's time to put up. I think this would be something you could do. And I said, well, that's great, except I don't know how to draw. So that's sort of a draw, a drawback. But I had a partner um, uh, who was a, a really good cartoonist, and he had had some cartoons in some national magazines and stuff. So uh, one weekend, I uh, wrote like 30 jokes, and um, and uh, he gave them him, and he drew them up, and we handed them to this guy, this editor. And uh, the next thing we know, some guy flew in from L.A., took us to lunch and put a syndication contract in front of us. I know this is not the way it happens to people. I know most people <laughs> spend a decade of submitting and stuff like that. Yeah. But for some reason, and uh, later on, I found the reason was they knew we were newspaper guys. There's a big problem in, in people making deadlines. And uh, he mm. strongly vouched for us. And um, uh, so Loose Parks was born. Uh, this was at the tail end of last century. Uh, and uh, uh, and then right after that, I got a second gig. Um, uh, there was a show on Comedy Central called Dr. Katz, Professional Therapist. I don't know if people do remember that. that. They I called really... me to write the comic strip for that and possibly do some writing for the show. So here I am working full time, coming home, writing the, you know, 30 gags a month for Loose Parts. Mm -hmm. And um, and um, uh Writing thirty gags a month for Doctor Katz, uh, wow. and and that lasted only about nine months. Uh, and unfortunately, my uh, partner John Gilpin got uh, sick. He got cancer. He's fine. We had drinks last Wednesday, but he didn't know at the time what he was going to go through. So he said, "You know, I got to drop out. We can't. Um, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how many weekends I have left. So I, I you know, I think we have to drop the the comic." Mm -hmm. we're in newspapers already mind you so i called them and i said uh hey would you mind if i drew the cartoon as well as wrote it and because they're professionals they said can you draw and i said no but i can learn <laughs> that's the question <laughs> and um uh, there was a big pause on the phone and they said yeah yeah go ahead and i hung up the phone Turned to my wife, said, my God, what have i done <laughs> uh we had about a six-week cushion maybe four-week cushion and so I had to learn how to draw really fast. Now, here's the deal. Luckily, I'm in a particularly corner of the card turning world where that didn't matter as much as the writing, you know, the single gag a day cartoon. Um, um, let's call it Farside. And I'll admit, listen, Farside hit the Philadelphia newspapers. I was the guy tasked to doing the ad campaign with it. I had never seen anything about like that before, and it altered the way I thought. Now, listen, I was familiar with Clyburn. I was f familiar with the New Yorker cartoonist. I was familiar with Charles Adams. I devoured Peter Benchley. I devoured Woody Allen books. I was steeped in comedy. So, so when I saw this, I just knew this was something special. So this is, I had to take this shot while we we're in the thing. So I would sit down 
after putting the kids to bed at night and start at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and I would stay up for however long it took me to get a cartoon done. In the early days, that was about three to four hours. Um, yeah. And if I couldn't draw it, I would rewrite it. Um, the very first cartoon I remember doing was a slanted line with the badly drawn top of a fish and below the line, it said down, and it was called Salmon at the Mall. Salmon going up the down escalator at the mall. Um, so I developed this weird style from that in that I couldn't draw eyes. So I gave everybody classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I was friends with Mark Tatuli. Mark Tatuli, who does uh, did Heart of the City, uh, does Leo, uh, does several uh, uh, middle school uh, books uh, series. Um, he and I knew each other from the advertising business in Philly. And uh, he was a big help to me at that time. And he said, uh, it's Mark, this, I'm struggling with this. He goes, no, no, no. Your, your, your drawing now matches your idea. Uh, mm -hmm. You're not giving it to someone else. It, it's somehow got your personality. So just stay at it. And so I, I stuck with it. And that was 25 years and 10,000 cartoons ago. So I have now done one cartoon every day since the year 2000 without a break. I have not taken a vacation. There has not been a repeat. Um, and now uh, I guess I kind of know how to draw. And um, and it's been a wonderful journey um, on many levels. It's it's um, it's it's been a, a great second half of my life. Uh, mm -hmm. Now that I no longer I've left left the newspaper in 2018. Um, so I feel like I have a lot more air in my life. Uh, and I get to be a fanboy. I get to meet all these wonderful people, and I'm not too jaded to get just crazy about how cool, <laughs> cool it all, all it is and how talented they are. And um, and and the fact that I feel some a little bit welcomed into their circles um uh is is quite an amazing thing. So that's very, the story. Cool. So that's that's the ugly, weird story of my life. I love it. I love it. That's a that's a very cool story. And I love how um uh, you know, one step leads to another and you found your way into this and the the talent that it takes, uh, I have to tell you, because, you know, people can go through a comic that's 22 pages or a graphic novel that's 200 pages or a comic strip that's three, four panels. But to do a one page that captures an idea, uh, that is quite a negotiation. That's that's quite a way of thinking about a page. It's um, uh, why it's far less work than drawing a whole <laughs> <laughs> well-drawn comics page. Um, it is. It's distilling down the idea. Um, in a way, it's almost a writer's medium more than it is an artist's medium. Mm. Uh, but I was, in a weird way, I was training for it without knowing that I was training for it. So, you know, you do a radio commercial, you get 60 seconds. So you have to learn brevity of language and how to, how to um, uh, make that work. Mm -hmm. um, when you're shooting TV commercials, again, you've got to look through a, at a single frame and make the communication happen fast and have it flow in a right way through that. You're doing stand-up comedy, you learn brevity of language and delivering a joke and a gag. And you work at a newspaper and in advertising, you're on deadlines. Mm -hmm. So I had this training for this, which turned out what I was sort of meant to do without knowing I was getting trained, which means like what I tell you, it's like, get on that side of that mountain. You know, um, the other perplexing thing about it is it made me wonder what else I'm good at that I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, am I a really good violin player? But I never really like took up the violin. It's yeah. a real, I, I, I haven't done it much, especially pre-pandemic. I started giving talks and, you know, sometimes it was, it, it was almost like a, don't underestimate your potential. You've got to at least give it a shot. Um, one of the interesting things, especially with school kids, um, there's a weird thing um, when you go to talk at schools or 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 I go back to my town of hometown of Erie, Pennsylvania, or even smaller places. Somehow the kids have it in their mind, or maybe they don't. You probably know this better than I do. That somehow talented people are only born in New York and L.A. and a handful <laughs> full of other places, and that yeah. if you weren't, that's it. it you know, talent has no idea where you're born. That's it just true. Doesn't. 
you know? So if you just discount yourself <laughs> from the get-go, like, no, look at me, look at this clown. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. You can do it. You know? Um, yeah. I mean, there, there is, a, it is a bit of perseverance though. I mean, you've got to, you yeah. got to stick at it. It's not an easy thing. I tell people, so Lou Sparks appears in newspapers every day, uh, all through the United States and Canada. And um, uh, it appears in some papers as a panel. Mm -hmm. It appears some places as strips, still one panel, but in a strip form. It appears some places black and white. It appears some places in color. And it appears in two different Sunday formats because I do a special shape for the Washington Post. Um, and um, so that means every month, not only do I write this stuff, I have to send... 106 pieces of art. Wow. So, wow. Um, I, it's it's really, I mean, the old story that I tell is, uh, I used to say at school is like, so this is what being a syndicated cartoonist is like, get yourself a, a pad of post-it notes. Um, and the first day I want you, first month, I just want you to put one up on the wall. That's all. Just got to remember to put one up on the wall every day. Mm -hmm. The next month, you get to put one up uh, every day with a joke on it that both your mother and your coolest friend would be okay with. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily in that order. Um, and then <laughs> um, the third month, you have to draw, do the, you know, put the post-it notes, write the joke, draw a picture. And then you just, you know, repeat that for a couple of decades. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a simple recipe um, <laughs> that anyone can follow. Um, There's uh, some demand there. <laughs> there's some demand there of course i'm tied to the newspaper world which has been interesting but um uh perhaps one of the biggest things to me and i hope i can get through this without crying is that um uh i was also a killer of syndicates so the la Times syndicate that first uh signed uh loose parts went out of business or was going out of business uh, about a year after that and then it was bought by the times mirror uh company or uh, times media in um, tribune media service in chicago mm -hmm. uh, and then they went bankrupt and were hanging on and then i was rescued um i was rescued while i was drunk on an aircraft carrier by charles schultz's old editor how's that that um, is a great yeah <laughs> we were at a, we were at an ncs <laughs> um uh, rubens weekend and for people who don't know national ncs national cartoon society the oldest and most august uh collection of um of uh, cartoonist, I think there is. And if you aren't a if you're a cartoonist and not a member, you really should be. Um, even if you're a young cartoonist, you can join for twenty seven bucks. If you're under twenty seven dollars, uh, uh, twenty seven years old, you can join for time. And you can go to these places and meet your your heroes. Anyways, in this case, we were at a party on um, on an aircraft carrier in San Diego, parked in the thing, and uh, a woman walks up to me who I kind of knew at late at night and she says how's it going and i said oh you know the cartoon's going great but the syndicate thing is wearing me down there the, you know bankruptcy and all that and she says why don't you come and know uh, work with come with us and i said great who are you and she said it's the washington post syndicate and so well you know you grow up with a journalism degree hoping to get a job at the washington post <laughs> as woodward and bernstein yeah. not necessarily in the comics pages but i took it um and then later that night uh, somebody said, hey, Dave, you were talking to Amy Lago. What was the deal? She said, I guess I, I'm trying to go. She's invited me over to the Washington Post syndicate. And they said, you know, that was Charles Schultz's last editor. And I said, I, 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 <laughs> what, what is she blind? What is she doing with me? Anyways, um, uh, that was uh, that was the one big moment I remember. The second big moment happened about two years ago. Um, the Washington Killer of Syndicates, the Washington Post, decided to get out of the comic syndication business and... Um, called me and said, you know, when your contract's up in three months, that's pretty much it. So I called Andrews McNeil, which is the largest and um, uh, biggest uh, syndicate there is, and they were lovely, and they took me in. And um, and we had a uh, gathering when the when the Rubin Awards weekend and was in Kansas City a couple of years ago in their um, offices, mm -hmm. cool offices. And somebody said, Dave, did you see the wall? And I said, what wall? This is the wall in the lobby. and And they have a wall in the lobby. And on it are the names of all the cartoonists they've had. I mean, anything from Ziggy to Blundy to the stuff and Gary Larson. They're the people who circulated Gary Larson. And there on the wall with Gary Larson's name is my name. Yeah. And I went down a hallway and only my wife saw me cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, it's an astonishing ride um, that I'm still on. Um, and uh, and it's it's been interesting.
So that is awesome. So awesome. I, I was going to ask about what makes comics this special place. And it sounds like some of those kinships and getting to be shoulder to shoulder with your heroes that way. I mean, yeah, it is. It is. Well, you know, they're generally everyone's really clever and funny people, which is just a blast to be around. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it over the pandemic, it's been interesting that though we we would meet almost weekly on Zoom calls. Um, a bunch of us, Mark Parisi, who, who does Wide of the Mark, and um, uh, uh, Rich Powell and Teresa Robert Logan and, and Maria Scrivan and um, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Wayno, who does Bizarro, and Dave Coverly and Dave Wam. We kind of all know each other, and which is which is really neat. Um, uh, Wayno and I, uh, you know, we meet each other often in Philadelphia. Our cartoons appear right next to each other, so it's kind of like, oh, you got the good idea this week, um, Parisi. <laughs> got a really good idea and screwed me this week um but uh they're all lovely people and um uh, i don't think they've figured out that i'm faking this whole thing yet um <laughs> but it turned out like i said i have a, an abiding love for the single panel cartoon form it's really the the cleverness in it um is um is uh is it, it, when you pull it off just right it's it's a it's a great feeling because you're right it's such a stripped down perfectly crafted um you know one little polished gem of something um and it's and there's no feeling like it when you when, when it comes out of the blue and and hits you in a in a in a certain way um and i'm happy to to in some small way to be carrying on that tradition you know that line that was started by you know uh, you know early on dennis menaces and stuff that transformed to to clive it into to then into um uh, uh you know certainly gary larson and then all the other people who are trying that same sort of thing it's weird i still get kind of an occasional angry email you far side ripoff <laughs> kind of guy you know your your stuff and i'm like yeah. i don't understand it because like i'm just trying to play the same kind of music you know like if you yeah. like sinatra wouldn't you listen to mel torme like or tony bennett that kind of thing uh yeah. i'm the first to admit i'm not sure i could could carry his uh his ink pen but um i'm just trying to keep that going and and the new yorker stuff too the brilliant cartoonists who are who are in and i've got to know some of those people um and stuff and actually i've sent some stuff in the recent year or two trying to break through in there it's just kind of hard when you're doing uh, daily comic to uh, to try to find time to find really special stuff and uh, and and do and submit that too. But it fills up the day. <laughs> yeah, up, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it does. Yeah. 106 pieces of art is that what you said? Yeah, right. Yeah, that'll fill yeah. the day. <laughs> well, it, it, the art mostly is drawn, and then a lot of it is some manipulating. I work. Um, I I first started working <laughs> uh, again because I'm not a trained cartoonist. I I just used copy paper from Staples and a mechanical mm -hmm. pencil I found in a drawer and an eraser I don't know I had left over from high school and yeah. I sat at the dining room table because my kids were smaller younger and um I wanted to be around the family and so I for the first 10 or 10 years or so kind of worked like that I would pencil I would then ink it with a micron I'd erase it, slap it on a flatbed spanner, I'd get it into Photoshop, and then I would try to finish it from there. Now, I was a graphic artist, self-trained graphic artist from being a creative director in advertising, so I, I kind of had some idea how to do layout and design and stuff like that. But um, uh, that went on for a really long time, and turns out I was a horrible eraser. I'm really bad at erasing lines. <laughs> I had real trouble <laughs> erasing lines. So eventually, when the Cintiq and the drawing tablets came uh, uh, years ago, I transferred to that so and it's made me a better drawer it's helped my line it's um uh helped me make corrections faster it's helped me try different flows of how the joke flows from one portion of the panel to the other if that makes sense mm -hmm. um um and how to navigate the space and stuff and uh, especially now that you know newspaper space is smaller you've got even less room to sort of tell your joke you can't make your gag too small you can't make your gag dependent on a really tiny detail anymore uh you have to be careful on how you do that um but but so far so good it's to some degree i sometimes think the the death notices from newspapers are overdrawn overblown and that um they're hanging in uh -huh. um and um and and without getting too deep in the weeds because the survival of newspapers is a is a bit of a passion of mine one or two basic 
judgments in in Supreme Court or something could change the way um, uh, newspapers uh, uh, get paid for their stories and how they should get paid for their stories and change just the way uh, Craigslist and the internet destroyed it, it could end up rescuing it in a strange way too. So uh, I don't count newspapers and comics out. And as I found, there are huge, you know, fans of it out and I'm just happy to be part of it. It's really neat. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know that you can go to go comics I know yep. that's one of the spots. Are there other places online where people can follow along and check out what you're doing and follow the wit as it comes to be and see the well, process? Yeah. Daily, you can see daily. It's best to see it in your newspaper. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and if it's not in your newspaper and you'd like it to be, um, just send them an, send them an email. I, I worked at newspapers long enough to know that um, it's surprisingly few numbers of emails that can turn that ship. Because uh, they see them as representative of a much bigger group of people, um, uh, and then of course, gocomics.com, uh, where you'll see you could see it daily, and you can go back, you can see an archive of like twenty years, I think it is. Uh, but don't go back too far because the drawing even makes me throw up. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, Instagram, I'm Lou Sparks guy um, on Instagram, where I post. I try to keep a sort of a rotating batch of about a hundred really good ones there. So if that's a really good place to go, if you want to just get a really good idea, or you can go to my site, looseparts.comic.com. And uh, on there, I, I, I occasionally post a, a bunch of them. And then I, um, that's where you'll see, you can see videos of me drawing them. You can see a bigger picture of what the studio looks like. Um, and you can buy books and you can buy any Loose Parts cartoon that strikes your fancy. In the bottom of it is my uh, is the link to looseparts.comic.com. And, um, um, and uh, that's it. I do a really nice uh, framed uh, cartoon of it. I sent four of them out today to various parts of the country. Um, uh, people who like it. It's a, it's a cool thing. It's a, it's a neat, I like doing it too, because it's a neat way. It's a great gift. It's a neat way to know your work is hanging in like people's homes and offices and around, which is, is kind of a cool thing. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Making that mark around the world, quite literally with, with the <laughs> wait, wait, wait. A couple of them is, I, I, I know um, my favorite one was uh, I did a, a, I did a, a cartoon one time of four birds on a wire uh -huh. Except one bird was beneath the wire with his head stuck to it, and it was just called Velcros. <laughs> um, and uh, the they, they, the assistant for the CEO of Velcro called and said, "We would like like ten of these to put them in our <laughs> lobbies of all of Velcro." And so uh, I did. And one day the doorbell rang, and a guy delivered a huge box of velcro swag i've got enough velcro <laughs> fasteners to uh to last me forever and beer uh they they know that i, I like beer so they put Very some beer nice. in in there as well so that was really cool so it's so, a so velcro guy <laughs> <laughs> very cool very cool and yeah. uh Oh, there's there's something here about how your work connects or how your work sticks. So something something like that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it <laughs> sticks, but when you take it off, it makes a loud noise. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, that's the problem with it. Yeah, it gets caught up in things. You get burrs on it. So. <laughs> it's quite all right. It's quite all right. It's worth it. But you totally you tell it. me now. The the, mm -hmm. the I'd be fascinated to know. Um, so you teach high school English, right? I do. Mm -hmm. What's the state of humor writing? Yeah, in in high schools, there there's a good amount of humor. There are kids that have the humor um, gene for sure. It's definitely there, and I bring. I think my students would say I bring a fair amount of humor to the sure. classroom. That's yeah. kind of. Uh, I don't have intimidation or fear, which I don't really want to do anyway. So I try to make humor work for me. So uh, I, I think they have a good time in my class at least. But, and but they I, seem I to mean, connect. do you ever like specifically give them an assignment? Oh Here, yes, write a cartoon write a satirical piece like would appear in, I don't know, The Onion or write a Saturday Night Live skit or or yes. something like that in order to 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 see how how humor goes into English and writing and stuff. Absolutely. Like and I'll use um, clips from SNL sometimes. Oh, really? To make oh, a point. See, oh, now yes. I want to take your class. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and it can be any decade in SNL, but um, we do like writing and creating. And I, so I give options um a good bit so we might do like a short writing or they could put it in a comic strip which i always have some students that are into and yeah. it'll be things like 
you know, we talked about 10 vocabulary words this week, reflect on three of them and write from the perspective of a sock that's left in a dryer or, you know, so- something like that. I try to find that's something great. or, you know, if, if vampires were real, but they didn't survive on blood, they survived on something else uh, and go, you know, so- something, something. There you creative. go. All right. Yeah. Great. You warm my heart knowing we try. that, 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 that kind of, sim- I learned English from nuns. <laughs> who I can't say were the funniest people. <laughs> I don't know a lot of stand-up nuns. No, I don't think there are any. There, um, uh, um, um, but uh, that's where I learned my English from, and uh, um, so I'm happy to see that uh, that that that. Although I would ask you if you see anybody who's really good to kind of just you know kill them before they take sure, your sure, jobs. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> I'll just be like, hey, you know what you yeah. should do is um, Here, you should think about. Yeah, steer them in the, in the other that's direction. Right. right. The world that's needs right. engineers, too. That's right. That's right. Have you thought about rubber bands, son? Plastic. That's where it's at. Plastic. Right, <laughs> yeah. No, it's great, though, when you see a really talented, you know, they they, they got it. Oh, I yeah. don't know how to say it. They got it. You know, at least it, occasionally you'd get a, you know, somebody in a sound booth or something. It's just, oh, she's got it. I just mm-hmm. I just know they're one of us. It's kind of like they're one of us. We they've got that creative kind of bent in there, and um, I mean to come full circle. That's one of the worst things that could, I could. That would be my version of hell, is to know that you've got creativity inside you, but circumstances don't allow you to practice it in some way or the other. Yeah. Um, no matter how old you are, no matter if you're a um, you know high school student, or middle school student whose parents are steering you in some direction, um, or an adult. Who hasn't tried it? Um, uh, you know, tried something. Um, uh, I'm always, I, I'm always baffled by. You know, you go into someone's house and they've got lots of music. They got albums. Kind of looks like your bookshelves behind you there. Like, wow, what a great collection! Oh man, do you, do you play? No. <laughs> and I, well, why not? <laughs> you know, <laughs> give it a go. It's really fun when, like, because again, yeah. I um. Um, I only learned to play the guitar when I was 50. Yeah. My wife learned cello shortly thereafter it, you know? And so it's just amazing. You pick stuff up. There's no time to stop learning and try new things. Um, although there's a banjo over here that just has proven not good for me. <laughs> it's, be- it's beating me. Steve Martin. <laughs> Steve Martin's a master. So I know. Go. I know. Can you believe <laughs> it? And then Steve Martin tries to do single panel cartoon strips with Harry Bliss. And I almost like flipped my lid when I saw it. It's like, Steve, do I come in? Well, I did try to play the banjo. You're just better at it than I, but man, that was something to see. It's like, do I need this? Do I really need Steve Martin to get into this business? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh, You know, it's listen, I'm not much of a fanboy for like movie stars and TV stars. I could care less if I get a lot of people's autographs or see them. But if there's a handful of people in my life I wouldn't mind sitting down and having lunch. A lunch with Steve Martin is on that list um, yeah, with I David would. Byrne and just, <laughs> just a handful of other people um, yeah. that I would probably w- would like to talk. He actually has. If you ever taken the master classes, uh, which is an online thing, my wife bought it for me for Christmas. He has a master class on comedy, That's which amazing. is is unbelievable, and it's really cool in that um, young comedy writers. Uh, comedians and or comedy writers, uh, there's four of them, write stuff and give it to them and he reviews it and gives them notes, which wow. is really an interesting way to see how he his brain works. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's really, it's it's a it's a good person to want to be. Yeah, yeah. And we're not promoing only murders in the building here or anything. <laughs> I'm excited about <laughs> season four, just yeah. throwing it out there. I, I well. would promote his other stuff. I mean, if you've never read any of his novels, Yes, um, absolutely. And even uh, Shop Girl is probably the one that was made in the movie, but there's one called The Pleasure of My Company mm-hmm. uh, about an agoraphobic who falls in love with a real estate agent um, he sees out the window who's selling the house across the way. It's a, it's really neat. He's a brilliant writer, too. The guy it just it fell in the deep end of the talent pool. Although if you've read his biography, um, again, it's very uh, uh, what we were talking about. There's a lot of discipline involved. Mm-hmm. He was very intentional with the wild and crazy guy stuff. Um, uh, you know, he wanted to zig when everyone else was zagging. Um, uh, and, and so he's a, he's a very smart, uh, purposeful, disciplined guy, which I admire as much as, you know, insanely funny. 
Absolutely. And um, there's Pure Drivel, which is his New Yorker essay collection. I like That's that one. Too. Pure Drivel, right. Yeah. And uh, and and um, still standing. He did a collaboration with Harry Bliss, I think, just recently. I, I read that. I thought I think it was a Christmas present or a birthday present or something for me. People know yeah. me too well. So yeah. funny guys. Yeah. John Definitely. Cleese would be the other one. That's oh, on. Yeah. Um, when I was making commercials, I used to pitch commercials with John Cleese in the paper all the time. And they're like, why? I said, because I just want to just want to meet him and have a have a you know, I'll do a commercial. But that never happened. You know, the um, she's a witch scene, of course, in Monty Python and sure. the Holy Grail. Yeah. Sure, of course. Uh, one of my favorite things as an English teacher is whenever I get to teach the crucible and I show that clip and try to convince my students, I'm like, this is from Act Three. You believe that, right? <laughs> <laughs> really different staging. That's really different great. staging. <laughs> uh, she turned me into a newt. That's right. I got better though. I got, I got better. better. Yeah. Well, <laughs> man, that, that was another thing that rocked my life, man. Just I can remember going in and out of the movie theater back and forth to watch Holy Grail over and over and over. And matter of fact, um, one of my daughters is getting married and I've been told that I have to stand up and say, um, marriage, (laughs) (laughs) but I prefer, um, let's not pick an argue over who killed who. It's a (laughs) wedding. supposed to be an happy occasion that's right that's right love it, love it. So, so apparently as i've raised I, close to my heart that she wants me to do that but, <laughs> but of course she's a doctor <laughs> humor brings us together go figure go figure my kid uh, it takes after my wife for sure yeah the joke is my um i have uh, two daughters one's a very talented uh web designer and illustrator she's fantastic jillian she lives in dc my wife paints and does makes tables like live edge tables and plays the cello and 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 you know and i do this <laughs> the joke is and olivia's just a doctor just a doctor. <laughs> just a, i bet she has a great bedside banner though i bet yeah, like oh, if yeah, someone she, needs she a joke she's got a very sharp sense of humor herself i don't want to sell her short short but it's <laughs> it's odd i i can't believe that that somehow i was just got any part of my genetic makeup in her <laughs> it's, it's pretty neat well, absolutely, absolutely. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, comedy is hard. So if you take something like the work you do in distilling a page, uh, that is quite an immense amount a, of effort and thought and planning. I had an odd thought a week or so, just a week or so ago. I, I got a, you know, I got a, a criticism on I don't know, online somewhere. And I can't yeah. say it was unwarranted. Um Somebody was like kind of snarky. Oh, yeah, I get it. That's really funny. That thing is so that's funny. It was like, and, and you know, listen, you do these every day. There are good days. There are bad days. Sure. Uh, but I thought, you know, and you, my first instinct, because I'm human, is you try it, pal. Right. <laughs> and, right. I, and then I then I wondered what other form of comedy writes a joke every single day without a break. Like mm-hmm. standups have a routine and may be working on it, but perform a handful of nights a week. TV series take breaks. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, other people do batches of cartoons and submit them. Um, I'm trying to think where it might be people who write for the opening monologues of the, sh- the, the, you know, the evening shows Fallon in that, mm-hmm. but that's they a have group. breaks too. Right. And there's, a yeah, they take breaks and that's a group. So I haven't, not written a joke for 25 years every day which is uh i don't i'd be curious to hear if anyone can think of something like that uh it's an exhausting (laughs) um but i you the more you do it though uh you learn um i've given talks on creativity at ad agencies and stuff uh, how to do it and um it's uh i used to think it was a big secret that i sit in a chair and i stare at a wall or ceiling Um, and I used to just kind of have my brain tuned and for things, but it was exhausting. Just your part, you know, you had a life to lead and and kids to raise and and a house to run and and a wife. Um, and, uh, so I, I long ago started making it very intentional. Often early in the week, I just sit down and I am going to write, I am going to write jokes and that's it. And you stare at the wall and you, and you, you, um, start smashing concepts together. Um, and occasionally page through magazines or other cartoon work or something. And you just, it, you, you try to, you make it happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to think that was a secret 
Um, but staring at a wall is hard, man. Like yeah. uh, it's, it's try it for two or three minutes, much less 15 or 20. If nothing's coming, um, I've read that it's actual painful, that super heavy concentration like that actually releases some painful stuff in your, in your brain. Mm, um, wow. but, um, I was seeing John Cleese said something the other day that I sort of also practiced for a long time. It's part of it is getting yourself into the play zone really quickly. Yeah. Um, people who don't do it routinely don't, once you get in the zone, things can flow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody can get there. But if you haven't done it, it takes longer and it's painful. I guess it's like exercise. If you haven't done it, it's longer and it's painful. Then when you run a lot, you can, you, it's not as painful. And so I'm really good at getting the zone really fast. Um, so uh, I can, I, I generally write, it takes me about an hour and a half or two hours to write like 10 mm -hmm. uh, gags. Mm -hmm. And um, that sets me up for the week because not all of them seem as funny the next day as they did when I, <laughs> when I thought of them the first time through. Uh, and sometimes none of them seem funny and I have to go back to the chair and, 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 and think again. So it's a very, attentional thing i i remember reading a while ago some trying to look up some science on it and apparently the closest i could got is that most people have a uh sort of a wall a metaphorical wall mm -hmm. in um um uh, in their head that prevents disparate thoughts from going together and um uh and you reject putting two ideas together without even knowing that you're rejecting them mm -hmm. I, I you know i don't know, ducks you know, birds and airplanes. And if you picture them, you picture the bird over here and the airplane over here. And if you try to put the bird inside the airplane, your brain, before you even know it, uh, rejects that concept of going together. Hmm. Um, but if you lower the wall and you learn how to lower the wall, you let some of that stuff over. And then you say, oh, what, what would happen if the bird was in the airplane? What would happen if the bird is flying the airplane? Uh, mm -hmm. What would happen if the bird is a vulture? then the co-pilot would be on the radio saying, listen, unless you guys kill something down there, I think we're going to be circling forever. <laughs> so that's sort of the one process I remember trying to consciously trace my thought pattern as I was doing it uh, in order to give a talk. But that's the more you train that wall to come down. Um, and then I'm a big proponent that creativity like this and humor, and it has uses beyond comics. You start learning in life, like how to approach people and relationships differently and jobs differently. Like maybe I don't go to battle with this person. Maybe I compliment this person and, and do this. It's not something I would instinctively have chosen to do, but this is how you kind of take that, lower that wall, let two disparate thoughts come together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's talking snakes. <laughs> Sometimes it's, you know, uh, fixing up a friendship. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting um, uh, concept that I'm still playing around with, um, and I'm sure I'll be playing around for a while. But um, uh, creativity is a very useful tool in life, um, and uh, uh, and it's just it turns out that it's uh, it's uh, when you combine it with I don't know how much talking you lecturing you want from me. <laughs> Here's one of the things to tell my girl, my daughters. Here's what cool is. This is a definition, dad's definition of cool. Mm -hmm. It's long, slow acquisition of skill. If somebody goes to the, the, the mall and buys a cool sweatshirt and comes in and it's really cool, you can go get that sweatshirt tomorrow. Yeah. It's not that cool. Yeah. Someone learns French or to play the piano or, I don't know, dedicates two decades to dinosaur bones mm -hmm. or, or it's just, those people have an innate sense of cool that yeah. no one else can go and take from you because you've spent time developing it a lot for a long, slow acquisition of skill. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so, and instinctively, those are sort of the coolest people. Those are people you gravitate to at parties um, who, right. who, who do that sort of thing. So um, that's the other thing about the, the, the being a daily newspaper cartoonist too. There's sort of a long, slow acquisition of skill that's still going on. I'm still learning how to do things. And I, I still sometimes, for a long time, I went where my only my jokes carried the cartoon. Mm -hmm. That if I could almost stand up on a stand-up stage and tell the joke and get the same laugh. 
but somewhere a couple of thousand in something shifted. And there were times where now the drawing, wow, look at this. Holy crap. This is, this is actually only funny if I can draw this well. Um, and that was a very meaningful hump to, to, to jump over um, uh, in the, in that sort of long skill acquisition kind of thing. Um, and, and the other thing I learned too, is just what a joy um, uh, it is to do this. And I think that's a secret that, I mean, the physical, I mean, this is the physical act of doing it. Like, um, oh, I, I watch a lot of your podcasts and, and see these great um, uh, comic book cartoonists. And I think people would say, and I've done it. I've watched people lay out graphic novels. Uh, uh, and I've had this discussion with Jamar and Nicholas, uh, like, like, uh, like, it's really fun to draw. I didn't realize that. It's mm -hmm. like this, this Zen you, know, you got music playing or a neat podcast and it, it's that there's a feeling to the the stylus or the pen on a paper that I didn't anticipate that part at all. I thought that was just something I had to get through. And only later did I learn, but it was a joy. It was a joyful thing. It was a, it was a joyful thing to do. Um, and I think that's, I, my sense is there's other things that there's joyful joy in doing stuff that you may not say, which gets loops back to try something that you may not have tried before because there may be a hunk of joy. Um, I think it was Wynton Marcellus. Who, who's the trumpet player? Wynton, Wynton Marcellus is the trumpet player, right? Uh, uh, I think so. Anyways, he had a, he, 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 he always had a line, find the joy in being serious. Mm -hmm. Like if you practice enough, there's a joy in there that you wouldn't think is there. Find the joy in being serious. Now I can't, I'm not going to find any joy. My job is not to be serious, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an interesting concept to play around. Um, and uh, and it speaks back again to what the weird influence cartooning has had on me. Um, uh, and uh, I'm also um, I'm also uh, more and more uh, find it my self appointed task make my cartoon a safe island in a world of antagonistic thoughts mm -hmm, uh mm -hmm. you know of division and you can't turn on you can't go on social media you can't go on tv you can't go on anywhere it's an assault of what side you're on or what you believe or stuff like that yeah. and so it's my goal to not preach to not do politics to not do anything you want talking giraffes you come to me. You want a Wolverine doing brain surgery? I'm your guy. But you're, <laughs> you're not getting any. And then in this world, it's nice to know, you know, there are few resting spots, and I mm -hmm. and and it makes me feel good to know that I can at least give, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, a few hundred thousand people around every day a little spot to kind of a little desert island for a cartoon joke, a little desert island to, to land on while you, while you fly across the ocean. Uh, so that not to get too deep, but that's, a, that, that's yeah. another hidden joy of doing this that, um, that caught me, blindsided me. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see the donkeys and the elephants get along. <laughs> if you want to see the donkeys and the <laughs> elephants get along. You know, I'm going to be careful. I don't even do, you put an elephant in your cartoon, you're going right. to get an email. Right, I, right. I, I am a shocked it doesn't happen because I purposely try not to do it, but I get in social media and, um, um, uh, you know, someone will take the most innocuous cartoon I'll do <laughs> and, and throw a political comment. And I try, I try to police it. I'll go on there and say, no, if this is a politics free zone, I don't, I don't want to hear this kind of stuff. There's no other people want to just breathe and, and, and kind of, uh, uh, get away from it. So hopefully I'm doing it. Um, so far so yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate the joy and love the, the creativity and human relationships idea you were talking about there as well. And I hope that it continues to bring you joy. I hope that it's, uh, some light in your day to at some well, point, uh, hopefully it's not too painful to, look at the wall and stare at the wall i'm good at it now I've gotten good at i'll be a great prisoner <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great I'll be a really good prisoner <laughs> next up victor hugo um <laughs> <laughs> that's right thank you yeah my name and victor hugo they just roll off the lips together doesn't they absolutely absolutely uh, so. 
Um, well, I, I greatly appreciate the time and glad to have you back anytime to talk about I'd be cartooning happy to come back and anytime. creativity. As you can tell, I love talking about this and I'm, I, I am humbled to be included with a bunch of the other, I'm sure, comic book artists who are rapidly Googling me and saying, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but you can uh, listen, just Google loose parts and Dave Blazik and you'll see a bunch of them. Uh, I should add uh, and promote and uh, promoting stuff uh, in the bottom of every single cartoon is my email address and my website. So if you want to get a hold of me, I love hearing from people. Sometimes it's the only way I know how I'm doing. Uh, believe it or not, I have greeting cards in the world. I got some greeting card deals. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of thing is around. If you really want, I got eight books. Um, hopefully have a new one coming out in the fall. I've started sort of pulling things together, but uh, you can buy those from my website and I draw in every one. So I will sign it to whoever you like and I will doodle in it and every like. And any Loose Parts cartoon you see, uh, look in the bottom, loosepartscomic.com and you can have that framed in a mat and I will draw on the mat and sign it and send it to anybody and uh, um, ship it right out of this lovely uh, uh, studio warehouse. And um, uh, so- if you like the stuff, there's plenty of ways you can get your hands on it. Wonderful, wonderful. And I will, of course, be sure to link the websites, all the things. And uh, again, such a kind person. And thank you so much for the conversation. Thanks, man. It's been fun. Thank you. Yes, yes. We'll plan again sometime soon. Yeah, be great.